And if you do go with burial at sea, those are some of the animals that might be gnawing on your corpse. <laughs> I love how charming and bubbly you sound when you say gnawing on your corpse. Welcome to Electric Enthusiasm, the podcast where we celebrate unironic enthusiasm. And you are going to die. <laughs> I'm Katie Cobalt. I will also die. <laughs> yes. And I'm Alexander Kilov, and I think this will be a killer episode. Hey, but a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alex, besides telling dad jokes, can you tell us how this works? <laughs> In each episode, one of us presents a topic that they love, but that the other one of us knows little or nothing about, and then tries their hardest to spread that enthusiasm to the other host and to you, the listener. Occasionally, we have guests on who are super excited about something that we know nothing about. We also have the moment of meta, where we nerd out about enthusiasm itself and talk about why it matters and how you can live a more enthusiastic life. Because the world needs more enthusiasm, and you should share yours with us on our website, electricenthusiasm.com, or our Instagram at electricenthusiasm. Tell us what you're excited about these days. Uh, you could even plain old send us an email at hello at electricenthusiasm.com. <laughs> Today's topic is something I love talking about, and so few people love talking about it with me. I'm really excited that you've agreed to talk to me about death, and yes. specifically body disposition. That is, what do you want to have done with your body when you die? Uh, this is often something that people haven't thought about, haven't mm -hmm. looked into, or genuinely don't want to think about, don't want to talk about. So we're going to be really death positive today on this episode of the podcast. <laughs> if that is not something you are in the right headspace for, feel free to skip this episode. Go back and listen to another one, maybe the Modesty Blaze episode or Avatar, something that's not so heavily focused on death. But if you are in the right headspace, today is your day to think about your human corpse. And I, I would say I'm there. I'm there. I was, I, you could even say I'm dying to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> How many of these do you have? <laughs> I don't know. They just come to me. I can't help it. Like... <laughs> so, Alex, have you thought much about what you would like done with your body when you die? Honestly, no. In, in Denmark, the two most common methods are burial or cremation. Mm -hmm. I have not made a choice either way. What I have done is, in, in Denmark, we have the thing where you have to actively register to be an organ donor. Mm, that's in great. case of brain death or, or actual death. And I have signed up for that. So, you know. Yay! Whatever, yeah. whatever, you know, take a cornea, grab a liver, use my kidneys. It's skin fine. Skin is I'm... also quite popular as a... Skin? As a, yeah, skin and corneas are like the two easiest things to harvest from a body. They did not know that. I kind of like the idea of somebody walking around with my face on or something. <laughs> I know a weird amount about this stuff. It's great. I, I looked a little bit into Danish funeral traditions because I was curious. Do you know if embalming is a really common practice in Denmark? No, I have never, ever heard of somebody doing that. Yeah, it is in a very American tradition, and it is something that I dislike. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, it's weird, right? It is. It is very strange. Today's topic is about different ways you can dispose of a body, and these are also some like more interesting ways, not necessarily legal in every <laughs> part of the world, but interesting traditions and interesting things uh, that are either like a historic tradition that is still continuing to this day, or historic tradition that we kind of forgot about, and we now need to redo it again because it's better for various wow. reasons. Wow, sounds great. The two methods of disposition that you already talked about, burying bodies and cremation, are not the most eco-friendly. And that's kind of my viewpoint on this, is that I want to have a really eco-friendly death. For example, in the United States, we bury each year enough metal to build the Golden Gate Bridge. Whoa. And almost 3,200 square meters of embalming fluid, which contains formaldehyde. Whoa. And 70,000 cubic meters of hardwood. Like, all of these are very useful, uh, and, well, some of them are useful. The formaldehyde, slightly less useful. But these are resources we're literally just putting into the ground. Uh-huh. All to just stop people from decomposing. You're going to get a reinforced concrete vault nowadays. And these things just all prevent your body doing what it's naturally going to do anyways. 
it's either that or stop the zombie uprising. You know, <laughs> if they do come back, you want them encased in concrete. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah so true. you know where they that's stay true. there, stay there, stay down, yeah. stay down. Yeah, exactly. Double tap. That is so weird. The decomposition would be perfectly natural, mm -hmm. and yet modern burial practices are essentially designed to stop that from happening. Yes. For whatever weird cultural reasons. Yeah, we have a fear of death and decay. Decay is bad. And we don't want to have that happen to our bodies. Sure. Um, as for cremation, cremation is extremely energy intensive. Did you know in order to cremate a body, you have to burn it at like a thousand degrees Celsius for up to four to six hours? I had no idea. I had it no takes idea. a lot to burn a body, which is why with funeral pyres, they're huge. Like you've seen images of Viking pyres or you see the Game of Thrones episode. Um, pyres have to be massive because they need to burn at a really high temperature for a really long time to actually get the body to, to become ash. If you just like put a body on a normal bonfire, you're just going to have a charred body. That's all you're going to have. That's just a barbecue. Yeah, it's <laughs> awkward. Um, <laughs> moreover, it pollutes the air and contributes to climate change. And like the number one thing for me is that it destroys the potential that we have to give back to the earth after we die. That's my priority. That's my goal. I want my body to give back to this earth that I've taken so much from when I die. I would like my last act as a body on this planet to be nourishing and not polluting. That's the dream. Yeah. So instead of cutting yourself off from nature, your physical remains will be going back to the nature that it came from. Yes. I, I think that's way more beautiful than an embalmed corpse in a concrete bunker or, or just ashes being burned and sent up through the chimney. I think at least in America, for sure, embalming is like a really common option. I think more than 50% of people just automatically get embalmed. Huh. Because maybe they don't necessarily think that it's an option not to get embalmed. They think it's maybe it, you have to to be safe. And or also embalming is really useful. Let's say you're like me and your relatives and friends and family live really far away from you. If you want to have an open casket, you kind of need to be embalmed. Because sure. otherwise the body will start decaying pretty quickly. And if people need to fly from different locations, then if you want to have that, embalming is kind of your option. Or if you had a very violent death. Embalming can also restore the body to make it look a little bit more like it did when it was still alive. Right, 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 right. Got it. Yeah, I can so, see that. There is some benefits, but I would argue for 99.9% .9 of the human population. <laughs> I agree. I, I, I agree completely. I see what you're saying. <laughs> So my first alternative burial solution for you is something that has been practiced for millennia, for a generation that we have kind of forgotten about it, except in Judaism and Islam, which inherently include natural burial as part of their religious practices. Mm -hmm. So natural burial is the interment of a body of a dead person in the soil that doesn't inhibit decomposition and allows the body to be naturally recycled. So you can be buried in like a linen shroud or maybe a wicker coffin or casket or something that will naturally decompose with you. And you've just like chucked in the ground, no embalming. Most natural burial cemeteries don't allow for embalming. If you are an embalmed body, you are not allowed to be buried in a natural burial cemetery. Yeah. But you can also get a conservation burial, which is my favorite. That is my number <laughs> one. If I can get this, that's what I want. What is that? It takes your burial fees to acquire land and restore native habitat to save the endangered species and protect the land from being developed. It is essentially chaining your body to a tree forever. Wow. It's so cool. I just love that idea that through my death, not only am I, you know, giving back to the world, but I'm also preventing future harm. That is super cool. In some places in the world, it is a thing. You can do that. Not everywhere, sadly. Got it. So instead of spending money on a casket and the whole burial thing, you, you, it goes to buying some land and then you're buried on that land or? Yeah, you're buried on that land. And then because it's now a burial site, it can no longer oh, be developed and they can't build it. on it. And so and it if, basically it, ensures a natural preserve. And if they do it anyway, and they build something there anyways, it turns into a whole poltergeist situation. And I get to haunt them forever. Yes. <laughs> Love it. That's great. That's, that's practical conservation in action. 
after yes. I'm dead where I don't have to consciously do anything about it. No. I love it. So simple. So good. It's That's so a great good. idea. Where, where in the world can you do this? Where is this available? There are some places in America. There's a couple places in the UK as well. I mm -hmm. didn't find any in Denmark, but I imagine the resources might be in Danish. Uh, yes, I'll have to look that up and see if that's something we do here. Incidentally, last week I did a little road trip to Bristol via Bath, and on the way to Bath, I saw a natural burial ground. And so I, this is why we're talking about this today, is because I saw it and I was very excited. So I Googled it and I looked it up, and they are also a conservation burial ground. And so I'm like, cool, goals, goals awesome. right here. <laughs> awesome. I love that idea. That is like one of my favorite options for uh, burial. But maybe. You don't want to decompose. Maybe you want to give back to the environment in a different way. So I would like to introduce you to the Tibetan funeral practice of sky burial. Have you ever heard of a sky burial? I have, actually. It is mentioned in my favorite comic book, The Saved Man. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, but, but, but do, do go on. Tell us how this works, because it is bizarre. It's a funeral practice in which a human corpse is placed on a mountaintop to decompose whilst exposed to the elements and encouraged to be eaten by scavenging animals, particularly vultures. The ritual behind it and the, like, the practice of Buddhism behind it is to dispose of the remains in as generous a way as possible. And so it's to allow for as much of you to be given back into the cycle of life as possible via being eaten by vultures. It's so cool. <laughs> yes. And how do they do it in practice? So they have a ritual where they will sing a song around the body, depending on the particular sect of Buddhism and, and where these monks are, they'll have different practices. Sometimes they just sing a little song and it's quite fun. It's quite like a nice jolly thing. It's not sad. The body is then placed on a mountaintop and they sing a song to encourage the carrion to arrive. And then they like walk away. When the body is bones, they will smash up the bones, mix it with flour uh, and rice and feed it to, to crows. So that every part of the body is consumed. Yeah. In some places, they will dismember the body and then mash it up a little bit to make it a little bit easier for the animals to digest. But that's not a common practice. It's important to note that both of the instances that I have just described were accounts written by European or American travelers visiting the region. I didn't find any resources written directly from the people who participate in this culture versus people ex observing the culture from the outside. But regardless, it's also very practical because they live on rocky mountaintops. It's really difficult to bury a body. You can't mm -hmm. dig the ground. That ground is rock. So it gives another solution to giving back to nature and giving back to the world. How do you feel about sky burials? That one is a little on the gruesome side, right? Are they there as the vultures descend and start feeding? Would, would friends and family and children and grandchildren be there and watch that? Or? From my understanding, it is only the monks who would be in attendance at that moment of the sky burial. Right. And also depending on the area, if you feed the, the vultures particularly frequently, the vultures are ready to pounce. And so sometimes they have to like shoo the vultures away so they can complete the ritual before it is presented to the vultures. There's a lot of rules about where you can put a body, both from the religious practice itself and also from the local Chinese government about making sure that bodies are not uh, infected with any diseases that might pass on to the vultures because they're endangered, making sure that they're not always being fed at specific locations, but they're spreading Spreading out the love. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like. I like it. It also it, it's it cuts out a middleman compared to the previous practice, right? You get buried in the soil. A, a yeah. nice tree grows. A squirrel eats the nuts, and you know <laughs> a, a, a scavenger or a, or a predator of some kind eats the squirrel, right? Yeah. In this case, your body goes straight into the predator or the scavenger. <laughs> I think you know it's that's it's practical. I like it. And yeah, what else are you gonna do? You know, you could burn him, but they probably don't have a lot of firewood either uh, yeah and also you probably want to save mountains. your firewood for the living surely exactly exactly so it's a practical solution it brings you closer to nature you're feeding the wild animals and helping them i think yeah all around it's a good way to go even if the actual you know watching somebody uh get eaten by <laughs> vultures would be pretty gruesome i guess i've seen photos it's it's interesting it's very interesting <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I don't think here in Copenhagen, I don't think you could, you know, just chuck somebody up on a rooftop and then wait for the seagulls to eat them. I also don't want seagulls to acquire the taste of human flesh. 
That's not something I'm willing <laughs> to have in this world. <laughs> they already have the taste for taste for human ice creams, so uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> no, that one is interesting, and I I know of it because I read the the comic book called The Sandman. I thought I'd get you with a weird one there, uh, but yeah, dark. no, I, that one. But before that, I had no idea it, ex it existed. When I read the comic book, I had no idea it was a real thing. I thought it was something Neil Gaiman made up for the comic book, but no, apparently that one is real. Fully a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so another body disposition option you might be interested in is burial at sea, uh -huh. which incidentally, like when you look up famous people buried at sea, it's, it's not what I would classically think of being as buried at sea. So if I tell you buried at sea, what do you imagine? You shroud the, the corpse in, in linen and then you chuck them overboard. Yeah. That's what yeah. I think of when I yeah. think buried at sea. I think if you are cremated and then your ashes are scattered at sea, that don't count. Uh -huh. In my no. opinion, it does count no. according to Wikipedia, but yeah. like to me, mm -hmm, you got cremated, your ashes, mm -hmm. you were interred in the ocean, but you were not sure. buried in the ocean. The thing that I find the most fascinating at burial at sea is the logistics of it. Like the logistics of actually getting a body into the water is actually a lot more difficult than you would think. And I find that fascinating. Wait, wait, wait. This, this goes beyond like three, two, one, heave? Yeah, because you can't just do that. Because huh? bodies float. Oh, yeah. Okay, I see that. You have to weigh down the body. You need to have something that's like secured around the body that's not going to let anything float away. And you have mm -hmm. to weigh it down. Back in the olden days, they would have fabric from sails and mm -hmm. they would fill them with cannonballs. Because right. you can't just chuck a body in the water. And the best thing about this is a bit gruesome, a bit weird. What happens, it's very fascinating to me. So our fat in our bodies, which is adipose, goes through a process when we're in the water and becomes something called adipocere, which is like this weird soapy substance that helps the body bloat and float, which is why okay. when you have bodies in the water, they look so different from what they looked like when they were alive. Oh. Which is why you can't just go three, two, one, heave. You have okay. to have a weight in the body. You have to make sure it's all secured. And then logistically, in most places in the world, you have to have permission to drop a body in the water. In the UK, at least, there's very specific locations where you're allowed to drop it off. So the coffin itself or whatever vessel the body is interred in must meet regulatory requirements. And then you have to drop that off in either the needles, which is in the Isle of Wight. If I wanted to go there, it would take me from where I am currently sitting a couple hours to get there. It's not that far. It's just one ferry ride for me. And then I cross an island and it's right there. So I can go check out a really cool burial ground, which I plan to do one day. Mm -hmm. Between Hastings and New Haven or in the North Thai side, Tyne side. These are British names, so they could be pronounced completely differently because the <laughs> British people do love doing that. <laughs> okay, question. So the body's in a shroud or something. Yes. So fish can't get at it and eat it or what? Uh, no. No, okay. ideally the body is is staying within the vessel that it was dropped into, and mm -hmm. it stays intact and sinks down to the bottom of the ocean. So well, that kind of yeah, that kind of obvious the purpose of you know going back to nature and becoming part of the circuit and all that, right? So one of the things it can do is it can act as a base for coral reefs to grow on. What if it was a net instead of a shroud, right? So, so you're still weighed work. down, but fish and crabs and that kind of thing can get at you. Like logistically, that would probably work. You'd have to have a really well-enforced net to make yeah. sure that no body parts escaped. Mm -hmm. However, this is the thing with a lot of these really interesting burial practices, the legality of it is really hard, <laughs> right? Like when it comes to body disposition, people are quite squeamish about it, including politicians who make the laws about what we're allowed to do and what we're allowed to have access to. So to be interred at sea, you have to like have a funeral director and there's like only like three funeral directors I could find in the UK who would actually offer burial at sea options. And of those three, like if you want to go anywhere else, that's not the three locations I mentioned, you have to like apply for it. And it's a whole process. Yeah, you probably could put a body in a net and weigh it down and chuck it in the ocean. Yeah. Would not be legal. <laughs> <laughs> it would very much not be okay. Got but it. you could. Got Some it. of these things I'm talking about are definitely not legal entirely all over the world yet. God. Like, for example, my next favorite option. So this was actually <laughs> featured in one of the books in the Wayfarer series. It was the third one, which was called Words. 
I should know this information. Hang on. Google. Google. Record of space for you. Thank you. So our next method of decomposition is natural organic reduction or human composting. So I first heard about this actually in the Wayfarer series in the book. Uh, I've already forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> In the third book of the series, A Record of a Spaceborn Few. And they actually consulted with Katrina Spade, who is the woman who really is pioneering this project um, called Recompose and really pushing forward. I will include a link to her TED Talk in the Doobly Doo. Mm -hmm. But natural organic reduction basically takes a huge inspiration from livestock composting. Recompose is a really awesome company working out of Seattle, which is taking this idea and like giving it like the this Silicon Valley tech spin that we all desperately did not need. But it's really cool because they've created this like beautiful wall of like hexagon. So it looks like a beehive. And each little hexagon is this like little capsule you can put a body inside of. In each capsule, you put a body with organic matter, like wood chips and flowers. This is where as a family member, you could be involved. Like you could be there when the body goes into the capsule, you can bring flowers from home, place it on the body. And like, that's where the interactivity and the ritual of it can come in mm -hmm. it's then placed into the the wall of bodies where microbial reaction starts happening the body and plant material remain in the vessel for about 30 days and microbes will break down everything into a molecular level resulting even the in bones? yeah even the bones everything wow. it's like a warm damp environment and the, the, the microbes love it it's tasty it's delicious they thrive and they form a nutrient-dense soil, and each body can create up to one cubic yard of soil, which is an obscene amount of soil. And so once it's finished, it's gets removed from the vessel, and it's allowed to cure, and then it is potentially given back to the family. So you could take it home and be like, put it in my garden, that tree is grandma. Isn't grandma beautiful? It's spring, she's flowering. I love it. I love it. It's, it's interesting that you uh, mention the Wayfarer series, because it's actually a thing. What do you do with dead bodies on a spaceship? There are two ways to go about this. Let's say you're on the International Space Station and one of the other astronauts has a heart attack. What are you going to, you can't just chuck the body out in space because that's a yeah. hazard that could collide with a satellite and cause damage. You can't keep it around because that's going to smell real bad real soon. Yeah, that's not good. If it happened now, one option would be to put the body in a spacesuit, close the spacesuit and lit nature take its course in there yeah. and then on the next ship down you can take the body with you there is a proposal for putting the body in a uh, really sturdy sack putting the sack outside where it will freeze solid yeah and then use a robot arm to shake it so everything becomes a powder <laughs> and then freeze the, the, the humans this remains essentially. basically freeze dried shaken fish feed humans yeah you can safely store the sack inside the spaceship and then send it down on the next transport. However, this is for current space travel as it currently exists, right? Mm -hmm. If we wanted to really colonize space, let's say we go to Mars or we go to the moon or whatever, there are nutrients in the body that you don't want to throw away. Yeah. You would want those to go back into the circuit somehow. And then something like what you described from the Wayfarer series would be essential. I mean, in addition to just the, the calories and the water in, in a dead body, there are micronutrients that, that are available on Earth that we get from our food that are not available in space. And if you throw the body away, you throw away those micronutrients. So you wouldn't have that luxury. You would have to compost the body, bury it, turn it into powder, and, and then use the powder to fertilize the stuff. But you had to do something with it. It would be a valuable resource. Yeah. And it would have to go back into the circuit of life. Yeah. I think this is one of the reasons why Becky Chambers included Katrina as contributors on um, the Wayfarer series, because this is a great solution for what we're going to do in space. Yeah. Like the original design that Katrina Spade came up with was like a giant um, kind of like a funnel almost. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. bodies get laid in at the top, and as they decompose, they'll they'll filter down, and at the bottom, you can take out the soil. And that was the original design for her projects. But obviously, people haven't been super comfortable with the idea of their their remains intermingling with other people's, which is why they have this little capsule system now where it's individuals. Right. But the original design was that everyone gets laid in into one 
like a large column of soil, essentially. Right. Got it. One of the things yes. I really like about what Recompose are doing, aside from the fact that like if you read their their requirements for staff, they seem to be really inclusive of all genders and all identities, which is super fucking cool. But they also have partnered with a local charity, which is all about reforesting specific areas of the Pacific Northwest, specifically looking at areas in which the salmon used to swim upstream to spawn, but no longer do due to rising temperatures of climate change. So one thing they can do is plant and support the growth of native trees around streams, which shade the streams and therefore lower the temperature, allowing salmon to spawn there more. And in an interview with one of the uh, volunteers working on this project, they were saying that if you go through Recompose and if you donate your soil to this project, you are not going to be a tree. You are going to be a forest. And a forest that is helping to fight climate change and bring back an endangered species. And isn't that just so fucking cool? Yes. As as opposed to the idea of your, you know, your embalmed corpse just lying there completely useless. Yeah. Wow. I just think that's so beautiful. Recompose is legal in very specific areas in the U.S. It's not legal um, all over the U.S. yet. I'm hoping that they do and they become legal internationally because I think it's a really great option for people in space stations or big cities. Spaces yeah. where there isn't a lot of space to have a natural burial, where there isn't a conservation burial option available to you. If you can like be in a small little capsule, become soil, and then that soil can then be transported and used to restore environments or for just growing food or plants in general. Like that is a great solution for people who live in larger cities or for people who live in space stations alike. Absolutely. I love it. It's a great idea. And then my final weird body disposition option is not so much giving back to the environment as it is not taking away as much from the environment. So we talked uh -huh. about cremation, which is burning your body at very, very high temperatures for very long periods of time. You can also have aquamation. Have you heard uh -huh. of aquamation before? I have, I have not. It's what is it? also sometimes called alkaline hydrolysis. In aquamation... The body is placed in a pressure vessel that is filled with a mixture of water and potassium hydroxide, which has got a very high, it's like lye, very high alkaline solution. Then it's heated to about 160 degrees C, which is not that much. That is not even enough to cook a cake at. It's a very reasonable temperature. But because it's in this pressurized um, vessel, it's at an elevated pressure, which prevents the water from being able to boil. And so instead, the body is effectively broken down into its chemical components and it takes about four to six hours. And then what you get at the end is like this weird powdery substance, which is similar to ashes and mm -hmm. just normal water that you can literally pour down the drain. It is perfectly safe water. It can be treated as a, at a water treatment plant. It's like any waste water you might have from a kitchen or something like that. Huh. And so it's less environmentally intensive. It requires less energy and less resources to create. You still have like an ashes-like substance at the end if you're really keen on scattering something. But it is way more environmentally friendly and also sciencey and cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anything with acids or right. alkalis. Yeah. Bases are cool. Yeah. I love that idea. But whatever's left of you is not nutrient-rich. not something you can... No fertilize your lawn with or something not particularly in okay. the u.s at the moment it's currently legal to do this for your pets but not for you <laughs> i like it but i like it less than some of the other ones it is cool and sciencey but it, you're not going back to nature and i dislike that a little. it's my last resort option personally for me like if i can't mm. be naturally buried because of legal purposes or some other reason yeah. i would prefer aquamation to cremation if at all possible I do think that, like you talked about, some people probably have like a, a cultural aversion to this idea of their body going back to nature, of mm. their body decomposing. But the interesting thing is that your body does that even while you're still alive. I mean, every time that you eat something that that's material going into your body, then you go to the bathroom, that's material going out of your body. Mm -hmm. Every every time you breathe in oxygen, you're also breathing out some CO2. Where do you think the carbon comes from? That comes from your own body. Yeah. Those are carbon molecules that are that that used to be a part of your body and now they're you're breathing them out every single breath you take. 
Yeah. So this idea that you can close yourself off in death, I think that's unnatural and wrong. You have been part of the circle your entire life. You will be part of the circle your entire life. Why not also while you are dead? This idea that all of the molecules in your body are, are replaced every seven years. Yeah. That's a vast oversimplification, of course, but they are molecules that are making up your body now are not the molecules you were made up of years ago. And that's, it's perfectly fine. That's the way it's supposed to be. What can happen at, at death is just that one end of the cycle continues. Mm -hmm. That's materials leaving your body. Uh, but, but the other one that materials going into your body, that's what stops. I think yeah. that it's a perfectly natural thing. I think when it comes to stuff like death, people are not necessarily thinking with their rational brains, maybe like rationally, I get it. You know, every seven years, we're a new body. We are part of the cycle of life. However, when it comes to death, some people have a lot of emotions around that. And I think it's yeah. totally valid for some people to actively try not to think about it or to try and make it as much about being a human person as opposed to a body, mm -hmm. right? If you become just a body that decays, that's not honoring who you were as a human and like your life. And I think that's some places of where this emotional reaction comes from because I think it is a very emotional reaction. And I think a lot of the, the culture around embalming and preserving the body, it's all about preserving the humanity of that person and trying yeah. not to just see them as materials, which we all are. Yeah, And it's whether or not that acceptance of those materials is part of your culture or not part of your culture. Because I think if it's not part of your culture and if you are very very much surrounded by this idea that, you know, a body needs to be preserved. We need to stave off decay because that's how we best honor that person's life. It's really hard to fight against that. Any cultural upbringing is always really hard to fight up against. But I think the addition of death being quite taboo and people not wanting to actively talk about death or think about death, I think mm -hmm. also contributes significantly to the squeamishness about it. Oh, yeah, for sure. There are very few, you know, adult conversations going on around these topics. And it's a shame because, you know, I mean, death and taxes, right? The only two things that are certain in life. I'm yeah. going to say it's really just death because like <laughs> the 1% has shown us taxes are not necessary, like going to happen very, for everybody. Very true. Very true. Maybe they can escape death sometime soon as well. But I hope not. Everybody I'm a little surprised because there, there is one alternative body disposal method that I was sure we were going to bring it up. Which is? So you can bury the body in the soil and that can goes into animals and animals go into humans. Uh, you could, you know, do something like a sky burial and then you go into the birds, the birds decompose, then you eat, maybe you eat the birds. But, but you could also just eat the body, which, which some cultures used to do. I'm really <laughs> hoping YouTube viewers of this particular program will see on my face the moment I realize where Alex is going with this. And how I was just like, okay, we're going there then all this morning. Okay, I have not had lunch yet, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bad idea. I'll say that right away. For mm -hmm. for many reasons, there are some very interesting diseases that you can get from that. They used to do it in Papua New Guinea. I mean, that was how they honored their dead, yeah. was by eating them. I mean, how, how could you not honor this dead relative by not taking a bite out of their flesh? Yeah. The problem is, of course, that they also ate the brains and that carries some prion diseases, something like Kreutzfeldt Jakobs, uh, a disease called Kuru that became very prevalent in those tribes. Mm -mm. It's a bad idea all around, but it is. Those cultures, that was perfectly normal. I'm not advocating it. It's not how I want to go. How would you feel about being eaten? As part <laughs> of my like research into this, I watch a lot of Ask a Mortician. Uh, and uh -huh. so she does a lot of videos on iconic deaths or really extreme situations. So like the Donner Party the plane that got stuck in the Andes with the yeah. football team where cannibalism became a method of survival and it was necessary in order to survive. I think that very specific circumstance where there is no other options available yeah, and if you don't, you will die. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. In that yeah, situation. Definitely. And if you are in that situation, one, I'm very impressed to listen to this podcast right now. You have other problems to worry about. <laughs> but if you are in that situation, make sure you eat the bone marrow as well. There's a lot of nutrients in there that you need. You also need to eat a lot of fat. It might be gross, yeah. but you need fat in order to absorb a lot of nutrients. 
Um, yeah, stay away from the brain, though. And I wish you the best in your ongoing journey of getting out of that situation. And I'm really <laughs> impressed you got this podcast episode to work on whatever device yeah. you have. And why are you yes. not using that device to call for help? I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're offline, but they downloaded the podcast. I, I think I know what I, I would like to have happened with my body now. That was my final question for you, which is, if yeah. you had a choice, yeah. what would you like to have done with your body? So there are two things. The decomposition one that you mentioned, you know, plant me like a tree. Mm -hmm. I, I like that idea. Alternatively, what Jeremy Bentham did, I think is pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the story? Yes. I saw yes. him. I used to live in London. I went to King's Cross. You're kidding. You've yeah. seen him. He just hangs out yeah. in the corridor. So it's weird. Explain what happened to him after he died. Jeremy Bentham wanted to be preserved and mummified. The actual thing that you see of him in King's College is not actually so much him anymore as it's mostly a wax figurine. But his head, his head just sits at his feet. Like there's a wax head of his actual likeness and then a mummified mm -hmm. head that just sits at his yeah. feet. Uh, and it used to and be a thing to steal the head because university students are idiots. Yeah, and the body's mostly straw, but it is his actual skeleton yes. inside his clothes. So he's sitting there, and he's now in a glass enclosure because people kept stealing the head. Mm -hmm. But he, that is his actual body on display in this university in London. They do occasionally wheel him out when they have uh, high-level meetings. Yeah. At the, at the last one, he was registered in the minutes of the meeting as present, but not voting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. I think in order to get that done, we're going to have to pull a few strings. Yeah, it, might yeah. be, it might be easier for decomposition, but I'm not saying no. I'm a big believer yeah, exactly. in everyone should have a choice of what they want done with their bodies in life and in death. But I think that one will be a bit tricky. Yeah, he did die in the 1800s where there were probably uh, fewer standards around it. I are like to think there was a little bit more mad scientists in the world back then. Yes, definitely. <laughs> But I, I still think it's pretty cool that he's actually on display, just, you know, his dead just body right there, hanging out where he's using, where he loves to go, where he loves to be anyway. That's true. That's I think true. it's fantastic. We didn't, we didn't talk about taxidermy at all. Well, there's not a lot of good <laughs> human taxidermy. And a lot of the human taxidermy that currently exists, including like, including plasticizing the bodies are yeah. questionable in terms of the consent of the participants of the bodies. Oh, yeah, the human body exposition yeah. that travels around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that one, and even historical taxidermy. There's a lot of instances of people who had different body types who were exhibited as circus freaks being mm -hmm. taxidermied against their will later in life. No way. Yeah, so there's a lot of instances where, for example, there's someone called the Irish Giant who really, really, really did not want this to happen to him. And, of course, it happened to him because you can exhibit a body. And you can get money for that. And capitalism mm -hmm. is terrible. I didn't want to talk about that. It's, it's a lot of sad shit. There's a lot of people making money off of people without their consent. And that's just not, not the best. Can we not? Yeah. Can we just not? Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> not. <laughs> so, Katie, for any of our listeners out there who are still undecided on what should be done with their bodies once they're dead, where could they go and learn more? I'm going to link you to a couple of TED Talks by the woman who founded Recompose, Katrina Spade, who I love. Also, Caitlin's YouTube channel, Ask a Mortician, has loads of information about all the different ways you can deal with the body, as well as what actually happens to your body in a crematorium. And I'll also link you to a couple of different organizations that are all about um, supporting eco-deaths or green burials that you can check out and see if you can find one in your area of living so that when you die, you can also try and find out a more ecological solution to your death because let's have the last thing we do on this planet be positive and not polluting and speaking of the materials i will of course have to add uh, the Monty python song on decomposing composers i would love that that'd be amazing <laughs> <laughs> alex what do you think of alternative body disposition options i'm so glad we talked about this you presented some really interesting options that i did not know about before and it's just such an important thing to think about. And, and a lot of people don't. There is no tradition for talking about this in, in most cultures. And I think we need to. So I'm so glad we talked about this. And yes, for me, it's either, you know, make me a tree or put me in a glass cage like Jeremy Bentham and then wheel me out occasionally whenever it would be the most fun. Noted. That's hilarious. I remember talking to my parents about this. My mom's pretty cool about talking about this stuff. My dad is really like not comfortable about it. He's mm -hmm. basically said, when I die, can you decide? Because you seem to know a lot about this stuff. 
<laughs> he's like, can I write in my yeah, will, yeah. whatever Katie says? And I'm like, yes, you can, sir. I will have a lot of opinions and I'm excited to do that. <laughs> uh, the death decider. Yeah. <sighs> That's Katie Kogel, death decider. Death decider. So what do you think about alternative body disposition? Do you have any questions or did we leave something interesting out about dying and decomposition and aquamation and burials? Um, Go to our website or our Instagram at Electric Enthusiasm to leave a comment. And also go check out what image I have to figure out to put on the graphic for this week's episode because fuck, I have no idea what I'm going to do for this one. I am just flummoxed. Um. Lummox. That could that could get gruesome. That could get gruesome. Uh, it needs to be Instagram friendly though. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So Katie, if somebody liked this episode, what other episode of ours do you think they'd also enjoy the hell out of? If they haven't listened to the Wayfarer episode, that would be a good place mm. to go as well because we talked a little bit about it today, and it'll give you a bit of context into why the third book in the series is. So interesting. I mean, it is the worst book in series, but it is also interesting because of the death stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then I'm thinking of the marine animals episode. Yeah. Yes, because that one also has death and destruction and, and that kind of thing. And if you do go with Burial at Sea, those are some of the animals that might be gnawing on your courts. <laughs> <laughs> I love how charming and bubbly you sound when you say gnawing on your corpse. <laughs> <laughs> Why not, right? Might as well be cheerful about it. We're all going to die anyway. Oh, I love the death positivity of this episode. It's so good. To my eternal shame, I set us, I set us the challenge for last week's episode, and then I completely forgot. Uh, to, to dig up something truly every day and find the, the beauty or the passion and the, or the enthusiasm in it. And I did. Katie, you've lived in some really big cities like, like London, uh, Hong Kong, Milan. Milan? Uh, I was in Turin, which is not a big Turin. city. Turin. Okay, got it. How do you feel about pigeons? I like pigeons. You do? I do, because I think pigeons are really cool. But I recognize that pigeons are seen as city rats. I just like animals, I think. I'm Again, yes. I'm the squishy marshmallow. I just like things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more in the, in the rats with mm-hmm. wings camp mm-hmm. myself. But there is something really amazing about pigeons. And I'm not talking about like woodland pigeons or forest pigeons or doves or anything. I'm talking about your bog standard city pigeon Mm -hmm. katie what color are they they're like a a shade of purple blue gray that seems Mm -hmm. to warp and shift in the light and it's very beautiful yes and that's the thing i had never ever noticed about pigeons i thought they were just gray right Mm. city pigeons have adapted this dark gray color because that's the color of concrete basically Mm. so it's adaptive camouflage in the city landscape but if you actually look at the feathers around their necks they're not only are they green and purple but they're iridescent they change color as they move around and the light hits them from different angles i had never (laughs) noticed that it is such a cool effect it's kind of rare in nature it's kind of rare everywhere and it, but if you really look at a pigeon, that is beautiful. It's so pretty. It looks amazing. I, I did some research on that. And I, I found a YouTube channel called, and I'm not even kidding here, Crazy Pigeon Lady. <laughs> she sounds like an expert yeah. in her field, and I'm excited to learn more about her. <laughs> We're going to link to her YouTube channel. She has a, a crazy amount of videos on various aspects of, of pigeons. There's also a, a series of videos called Ask the Crazy Pigeon Lady. If our viewers have any questions about pigeons after this, they can go to her channel and ask her anything about pigeons. She talks about how this works, and it's not it's not actually a color. It's not a matter of coloration on on the, the feathers themselves. It's the structure of the feathers that allows them to refract the light in different ways. So I think I actually know a little bit about this already. I think go on. my understanding of it is that it's not a pigment but it's the mm-hmm. structure of the cells and the structure of the cells are, are formed in such a way that reflects certain wavelengths of light. Is that correct? That is exactly correct. Very good, Katie. Full marks, 10 points for a Gryffindor. Yes. <laughs> this is because I did a University of Toronto Dinosaur 101 course a couple of years ago. Yes, because this, this kind of coloration, yeah, goes all the way back to the dinosaurs. There was yes. a dinosaur species that they found that they assume had this particular effect. It's so cool. Do you also know why pigeons have it? 
pretty? Because pretty. Uh, cause, cause kinda, kinda. <laughs> Cause it's not, it's not good camouflage, right? Oh. Unless you're, unless you're a pigeon hiding in front of a neon sign. <laughs> Again, I think I know a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. I like animals. Can you tell? Yes. My understanding of it is that female birds really like beautiful things. Like they have a sense of taste and they like beautiful things. And they actively choose towards beautiful male version of the species, which breeds more and more beauty in the species. And then also has the added effect of like, if you're a really flashy, beautiful bird, and you survive to adulthood, it must mean you've got some good survival skills in you, which makes you a good option to reproduce with. Is yes. what I understand it to be? It is, a, it is absolutely a sex thing. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you reduced everything I said down to, it's a sex thing, though. <laughs> it's a sex thing. Yeah, that's what it is. That is exactly what it is. The prime example of that kind of thing would be the male peacock's mm -hmm. tail. Which yes. is a terrible thing from a survival perspective, right? If, if you're being chased by a predator, you do not want to be dragging that thing behind you. Um, no. But if you have it and you've survived, it means you're awesome. It means you're really strong. And and if I were an RPN, I should probably mate with you. Yeah. So that's why they have it and that's how it works. Once I learned that, I've started looking at pigeons differently. And there's less of that yuck. They're disgusting and more of that, oh my God, they're beautiful. And they are beautiful. And that uh, was entirely yeah. the goal of this exercise. One thing is to create enthusiasm, but if you can turn, if you can turn disgust into enthusiasm, so much the better. And, you know, pigeons are all around. They're a fact of modern life, modern city life. Uh, might as well be enthusiastic about them. And they're, they're beautiful animals. They really are. Dear listener, the next time you see a pigeon. Really look, honestly, really look at it and you'll see those colors changing. It's not even a subtle thing. It's very, very obvious once you know about it. But until I heard about this, I had never even noticed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so weird. You can also see a similar color shift in magpies and crows and other corvids. Mm -hmm. Like their black feathers actually in a certain light look blue. And it is like the direct inspiration for my hair. Like I want my ah. hair to look like a corvid feather. Where in some lights, it can look blue-green, but in dark lights, it's just black. That's like what I'm always going for with my hair color. Got it. But nobody has yet invented uh, iridescent hair coloring. I don't think. But you do what you can with the tools you got. Yes, exactly. And until we can uh, genetically engineer humans to have feathers, that's the best we can do. Cool. That's really fascinating. I'm really glad that you managed to turn your disgust into something beautiful and lovely. Yes. Also, I really liked this exercise. I thought it was really cool. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed sharing some of our enthusiasms in this episode. Please visit our website at electricenthusiasm.com or find us on our Instagram at electricenthusiasm to discover more episodes or to leave a comment. And now, dear listener, make like a tree and leave. <laughs> you had one more. <laughs> You had one more. <laughs> I did. I did. It was not I did. ready. <laughs> <laughs>